Welcome to the Brain Coffee Podcast, where doctors Eric Luthard and Albert Kim unlock life's little mysteries about health, wellness, entertainment, technology, and how the brain makes sense of it all. Sit back, relax, and open up your mind. Yeah, again, there's been several movies about, uh, uh, you know, this notion of, you mentioned earlier, like, we don't use the full percentage of our of our cognitive capacity or our brain. So yes. what would the world look like if, or what would a person look like if they increase, like, they went from, yeah, I don't even know the percentage, but 2x their percentage of their, their brain utilization. Yeah, there, I mean, there are movies about this, right? Scarlett sure. Johansson, Bradley Cooper. Right, right, right. Um, People say Einstein used 15% of his brain, whatever that means, right, honestly. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so what do, you, what do you, any general thoughts about that? I, yeah, I guess I would say that if I had to guess, that probably as you go down, you know, the evolution in terms of lower animals, mm -hmm. my guess would be that the lower animals use a higher percent of their brain than we do. Oh, interesting. That, that, I mean, I, I have no, no evidence for that other than sort of a... a like a worm's going to use, worm's yes. gonna use the, all yes. it's got because... You know, yes. It's yes. using its 10 neur... I mean, it's not yes. 10, right. but very few neurons, yes. right. yeah, for instance. Yeah. So how about, how about other differences between... Uh, yeah, right, just a few hundred uh, for worms. But how about what's the difference between brains of lower animals and us? That's, how about that's what kind of differences? Really, yeah. yeah, so there, you know, we've been focused on neurons and which are nerve cells right mm -hmm. these are the cells mm -hmm. that we talked about sure. you know that receive information send information make synaptic connections with mm -hmm. each other mm -hmm. but actually there are other types of cells there's another cell type in the brain that is really quite quite important uh, mm -hmm. that we know even less about and it's somewhat mysterious and that you find what's interesting and it's called a glial cell Mm -hmm. And glia, because uh, it basically stands for, basically, uh, the th German pathologist who discovered it uh, uh, referred to it as glue. Oh, interesting. And, oh, is that right? So they're yeah. basically, but they're not, they're, but they're not really, oh. yeah, they don't, they, they thought of them as support cells That's that right. glue the rest of the oh, interesting. brain together, but has no... We, we, perhaps you should check to make sure that. No, no, that, that's, that's cool. But it's always a German or French pathologist, yes, also. Right. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the astrocyte definitely was Verkau, who is a German pathologist oh, who see. discovered the astrocyte, mm -hmm. which is a star-like gl glial mm -hmm. cell. Mm -hmm. And their idea was that these cells, like the astrocytes, are just really there to essentially form connective tissue for the brain, mm -hmm. so that it yeah. has support. What's really exciting in terms of this uh, lighter conversation we had earlier, mm -hmm. just a moment ago, about uh, brains and how much we're using, as you go from lower animals mm -hmm. to higher to higher animals to the human brain, uh, there are actually you see more and more glial cells, oh. more and more of these cells like astrocytes, mm -hmm. relative to the number of brains, mm -hmm. the nerve cells. So we still don't really know what these cells do. We do have some ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know that they're really, really important during brain development for the neurons to be able to migrate, to mm -hmm. go from where they're born to where they're going to reside mm -hmm. uh, you know, within the brain. Uh, we also know that uh, in some animals, the, the astrocytes are important informing the the barrier between the blood and the brain because mm -hmm. that's really important to but more and more we think that the ner these glial cells are not just providing support and nutrients and that sort of thing for the nerve cells but actually are also important in information processing well, they also have electrical potentials they do and they just do. like neurons but it's at slower time scales yeah and uh, uh, and they actually i remember looking at some of this stuff a while back but also they can encode direction and uh, uh, you know kind of the field you know for instance in, in cort uh, occipital cortex yeah. they can they can also kind of encode information about location yeah and so. and so they are they they have calcium waves they have right. uh, activity and and uh, and of course a lot of disease from a disease point of view we really have to understand them because they are the cells that form by and large, the brain tumors. Oh yeah, the uh, progenitors of glia definitely are they do. cell of origin for and them. There, we have a, a very exciting uh, uh, story actually right now that's not published even, mm -hmm. where we're oh, studying wow. the role of these glia in migraine. And oh, interesting. Yeah, so we think that it's going to be really relevant. Now there have been some ideas about that, but we think we have something oh. really interesting uh, on that. So 
So these cells are really important in many. So what would be interesting is, so in, I remember we talked earlier, like we had this debate about like, you know, is the size of your brain relevant to kind of, you know, kind of global intelligence? So, so for instance, you know, a chimp's brain is larger than a raven's brain, but a raven could be argued to be smarter than a chimp. Well, it, yeah, well, so uh, raven specialization or? Well, no, 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 no. In, uh, fluid intelligence. So ravens uh. can do a better job of uh, uh, memory and planning than a chimp does. So for instance, um, a raven can, is better at creating a tool to get what it needs and can think in multiple in multiple steps that a chimp can't do. Really? Yeah, it's, there's been a number of scientific studies done on this, which is really quite fascinating. So a raven is smarter than a chimp in- uh, well, In uh, certain domains, I guess. In executive yeah. planning and tool use. Uh, I see, I see, I see. But maybe not social leadership behaviors. Maybe, like, yeah. maybe, yeah, maybe there's, yeah, maybe that's a good point. Like, so they don't have as much um, social kind of interactions like chimps do, but executive planning, they're better. That's uh, interesting. In, in terms of evolution, uh, I think it's uh, becoming also interesting that the genes are somewhat, di you know, there's very, well, if we stick to the primates, okay. to the, uh -huh. you know, chimp and monkeys mm -hmm. and, and human brain, they're like over, a very, very high percent in the high 90s. That's right. Very similar, right? That's oh, right. Yeah. That's but right. there are actually some genes that are different between the human brain and the uh, and the primate brain. Isn't that and, the, and it doesn't have to do with the brain folding? Yeah. Well, we that think that we think that it could be that it's relevant to that because mm -hmm. that's one of the things that's quite different right. in terms of the, the folding. Mm -hmm. But you're talking about genes that exist in a human but do not exist in a human? Well, no, they, the they exist. It's the same genes, but, but they're quite different. I see, and I the, see. And there's been a lot of evolutionary change in those within those genes. It's not that it's an entirely new gene, but there are changes within the gene that are quite different from the human versus the chimp. So different enough so that yes. maybe its function is, is and modified. Even, and even in the way, like we're talking about how genes are regulated mm -hmm. by epigenetics, they are in the regions that are regulatory regions. Uh -huh. Those are those can be different as well. I see, between, I see. And so there's a lot of interest in that because you know, it could have potential implications for you know, why a human, you know, a human learns to speak Right. And to basically, and, you know, have all of the wonderful abilities that humans do right. that, you know, a, a primate brain, a primate does not have. So I it's... See. So well, maybe well, upbringing, to, maybe to, to speaking of science fiction and like to cite science, some science, some critical science fiction literature the, <laughs> in the Planet of the Apes, if you remember <laughs> that. Yes, yes. Like they... Uh, so there what was, happens there? Well, so... Um, so two things. One is in Planet of the Apes, uh, basically they had figured out some of the genetic, these genetic modifications and yeah. made the apes smarter and they learned speech, right? And then, then they became smarter and that's what right. led to the ape revolution. Right. Um, but then um, the... Uh, uh, Were these uh, genes that are involved in asymmetry? Because you know like the brain, the human brain has asymmetry, right? I don't know if the movie went into that level of depth, um, but, uh, but then the virus that they made to change the apes affected humans and they lost their ability to speak. Right. And that's oh, why, like, wow. in, the, okay. in, the, in the future world of Planet of the Apes, the apes were the smart people, and the humans had lost their ability to speech and were much, were much more primate-like. And so yeah. when that guy shows up in the future, um, yeah. you know, he, there's this whole world reversal. So I, I think in terms of science fiction, if I recall correctly, the one that I am always uh, sort of think back to is, uh, is an episode, I think, of Star Trek, where they have, you know, these people who just have brains. Uh, and they're like, in a, they're like, it's like, like in a bowl, a, in like, yeah, like in a bowl or like an like an incubator. Uh, but yeah. they control everything because ultimately you don't really, you just need a brain. You don't need anything else. Well, the thing it's is, so all, nice our, right, all right. our brain does is like you know control muscles, right, and then gets input. So and then you have to feed the brain. Right, right, right. But with brain machine <laughs> interface, right, you probably yeah. don't need uh, like in well, terms of thinking, in terms of well, future. there's a, there's a lot of people who think about this, uh, um, and there's actually you know again my second you know uh, uh, book was about people downloading their brains into right. kind of a computer system, and but there's actually people who there it's called Project 2052 I think it's a, it's, it's been founded by a Russian oligarch, uh -huh. and basically his the goal of this and they're doing it in stages is to basically allow you to have. Uh, uh, digital immortality where basically you 
upload your your brain and your consciousness to a digital world, right. and um, then you know that then you don't need your body anymore. You don't need anything. You, you get your input and output, but it's all on a, you're all <laughs> on a it's server. A, it's a little bit similar to Westworld, I guess. Yeah, right. right, right yeah, that's right, right. That's right. right. Um, great show. Yeah. The 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 sort of the ultimate project in Westworld. Right, right. It's right. really about digital immortality. Them. Spoiler alert! Right. You don't. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> right. But yeah, but that's right. Like you know, like can you fully um, decode a brain right. and and convert that information to, into a non biologic format so that right. you can exist and that that would allow you to have essentially in, infinitely interchangeable parts and infinitely like you know new new sensory capabilities and output capabilities. Right. Yeah, I think it's a, but how do you, so in terms of thinking about uh, the brain and relative to the other organs, and you know, we always think about sort of in popular language and so on, interactions where you talk about making decisions with your head versus with your gut or your heart. So do you think that is, I mean, is it, when we talk about the heart and, and uh, gut, is it, do you feel that also is actually a reflection of the part of the nervous system that the autonomic you know, nervous actually, system? You know, actually, I think this is, this yeah, is, this a, is really, a lot of different areas. You know, like yeah. it's a brain, basically so, it's another brain, because there's another brain within our gut. That, there's an absolute nervous system. Absolutely. I think this is a really, really interesting, we always assume that our, the seat of our conscious and all the decision making happens kind of within that thing in our in, a calvarium, right? Right, right? Within our skull. But, the you know, we have- gland. What's that? Right, right within the pineal, pineal gland. The soul is in the pineal gland. Yeah, right, right. But but that we, you know, that that whole information processing system may actually be much more widely distributed. We've yeah. got a nervous system in our gut, as yeah. you mentioned, but there's actually been recent studies about the immune system being like integral in, in our ability to sense kind of you know our gut biome and how it interacts with our brain, and that's another kind of way that we're interacting with the world around us. No, but the, I mean, you you and I have seen this, and, and it's been reported on. I mean, people who lose the ability to move, you know, let's say they have a right. fractured uh, cervical spine. Right. After a while, they say they feel that they've lost some part of themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think a lot of that might be just the feedback that they get from right. their limbs and, you know, the feedback I, between I, them, I right? I think it all comes back to the cerebellum, actually. Mm. <laughs> because, <laughs> I, because I think, you know, you're talking about downloading things. Uh, uh. So that the cerebellum, uh, but just as an aside, let me, let me give you this uh, picture. So when I started the lab, uh, you know, almost two decades ago, mm -hmm. uh, and we focused the lab on, stu on studying the cerebellum, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically looking at how uh, uh, nerve cells respond to stim stimuli, how, you know, how, the brain how the nerve cells develop, but we really focused it on the cerebellum because it's a really great structure, mm -hmm. relatively simple compared to the cerebral cortex, which is much more evolved. Uh, and my... Uh, now oldest uh, was, uh, I'm trying to remember how old he was, he was probably uh, something like seven years old mm -hmm. or something like that, seven or eight. And he, I told him about the, that we're studying the cerebellum mm -hmm. and where it was. And so he, didn't, I, he thought that I meant that the cerebellum controls the rest of the brain. So he <laughs> drew this picture, which I don't have anymore on the computer, uh -huh. which had you know, a picture of uh, the you know, human brain and then there was inside this skull was like a little brain uh -huh. in the back, and he had arrows going to the other part of the brain. That's and I awesome. said, what, do you, "What does that mean?" And he said, "Well, this you told me you work on this little brain that yeah. controls uh -huh. the brain. You know how kids are interested in right. like you know the serial logic of right. you know what controls what." Right, right. So, but then that actually gave me an idea, which is that, and and I think it's really uh, it's probably uh, something realistic, which is that. There are that the cerebellum is important in controlling other parts of the brain, and what's interesting is we know for motor coordination that uh, you know as the brain, as the cerebral cortex commands the muscles to yeah. do something, it always leaves a copy of that right. information in the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. It's called the efferent copy, right, right, right. and uh, and I think in the human brain the cerebellum is actually quite evolved. And it's not just uh, just for motor coordination. It's actually well. There's quite, a language connection too. Absolutely, and and I think even for say social interactions, for everything. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely an, right. So I think there's an efferent copy of everything in the cerebellum. So 
I feel that there's untapped potential uh -huh. in the so, cerebellum. So if, if we want to basically yeah. download our brains, yes, we, we, we should have an actually, easier, you know, yes, we, can, I think so. we can go to the I cerebellum. I think the cerebellum is a good place and to start. And then basically keep the E for copy. And everything goes to the cerebellum, right? Uh, From, or tur turbocharge the cerebellum is another to, thought to, to increase cognitive ability, yes, maybe. Yes, yes, yeah, because, and I think that there, that if you lose a part of the cerebral cortex, there may be a way to retrieve that information from the cerebellum oh. to another region of the cerebellum. It's your backup copy. It's, it's exactly. Our, it's it's a motor, motor hard copy. drive or something. Now, it's done. It's put there because it's a way to control. Like for motor coordination, it's easy to understand. If you move your, you know, your, your when the doctor, neurologist asks you to do the finger nose task, you know, yeah, yeah. touch touch your nose, touch my finger, right. and you're doing it very smoothly. Mm -hmm. Without the cerebellum, of course, it would be you sort wobble. of... You Maybe wobble. this is worth unpacking. Like so I think it's it's going to be similar for other things, like for social interactions, for memory. Uh, it's for making sure you're within social interaction. Exactly. Absolutely. I actually totally agree. Yeah. So this is an it's, idea it's that, an I, that I was system. inspired by my by, by Juvan, by <laughs> yeah. my kid from this picture that he drew. But basically, it's an optimizer, right? You know, so like, I, I and so, so. It, it maintains a copy yeah. so that you get feedback, so you can optimize whatever it is that you're doing, yes. whether it's language, social, yes. motor. I think so. And um, and I mean, I think there's real truth to this. As an example, like I did a, a surgery on a, a, a guy who had a, a tumor, and actually I had to take out a big portion of his cerebellum. Mm -hmm. High functioning individual. Uh, he was a principal at a school, and um, and as it turned out. Uh, he had pro problems working because he couldn't multitask anymore. Oh. And one wouldn't expect that multitasking would be affected by your oh, cerebellum. Oh, that's interesting. Right? Yeah. And he actually had to you know, kind of stop working. And, um, but, so I think his optimization skills for a lot of like, uh, social things were, were challenged after that. I, I should cr also credit uh, uh, Ito, who's a, you know, a, an expert on the cerebellum from Japan. Um, who refer he hasn't talked about this thing for social and language, but he talks about the cerebellum as the implicit self or some something like oh, that. Oh, interesting. And you know, it's interesting because even in Alzheimer's, right, could be interesting because in Alzheimer's, as you know, in the dementias, I mean, this is completely science fiction. Yeah. No, but no, no, so no. It, uh, don't hold me to this. Yes. But uh, <laughs> that's, but, that's the point. But you know, the pathology that takes place is doesn't affect the cerebellum. It's it, for some reason the cerebellum is is immune to well, the you know, amyloidopathies oh. and that sort of thing. You often you, people use it as a control usually. No, you're you're right because yeah. it usually happens in the cerebral cortex, right? But what if we could, you know, what if that information is stored in the cerebellar hemisphere? You know, not the midline part of the cerebellum, right. but the, you know, could we somehow transfer it back? Transfer it back to a region that's not affected, or once we yeah, right. we've. This could be for you know, like your computer, 100 years from now. Your computer so. crashes, no, really you know, what I mean? like basically, like when, when your computer crashes, yeah. you got your backup copy. Exactly. And basically, you say, oh, like I'm going to wipe it and then I'm going to reload. Uh, it. I think so. I think that the because and remember, what's really interesting about the cerebellum is there are actually more nerve cells in the cerebellum than the entire brain yeah. combined. That's right. Isn't that fascinating? Yeah, that is fascinating. That is amazing. And so there are lots and lots of connections, and people have been thinking, well, it's a relatively simple system. They want to understand the cerebral cortex. Right. I a lot of times, from a neurosurgical standpoint, you're like, eh, it's yeah, I know. I'm like, you know, no, you're right. I actually think you could just take it out. I still don't it, really yeah. understand how it works, and it's and the field has really uh, kind of uh, neglected it, I think. Mm -hmm. And and you know, there are, there are multiple learning paradigms for the hippocampus, for the for yeah. the you know cerebral cortex, and so on. But in the cerebellum, there are only two learning paradigms that have that are well established uh one is uh you know this is getting technical but the delay eye blink conditioning and one is the vestibulo ocular reflex uh -huh. adaptation uh -huh. of oh, that yeah we do that all the but time, in, right? in my lab recently a really talented uh, uh set of postdocs have established a new a completely new learning paradigm in the cerebellum and we're learning a lot about how uh, this is also not published yet. We're learning about how uh, the nerve cells respond to that, what happens to the activation of the n nerve cells, and even on the epigenetics. What are the epigenetics? This gets my whole brain-computer interface mind oh, yeah. going. Like, so you know, we like should what, talk. <laughs> what could, how could you, you know, because the thing is, that, that would it be an easy area to stimulate? Huh. Yeah. I mean, the question is, how do you access that information again? Well, that, and I think it's not going to be as simple as saying, okay, here's like, a set of numbers there, but it's yeah. probably what are the changes that have taken place at a synaptic level, at a cellular level, at a molecular level, 
and this is why it's science fiction because I don't know how you would take all of that information and say reload it, upload it back. Uh, well, you, uh, there, there's a neural code, right? You know, like so. Basically, you would have to say, okay, here's how the brain encodes information. Here's how the cerebellum encodes information. Here's how that transference happens. Yeah. And then, how and would then, you decode the cerebellar then, code again? Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, it's it's encrypted in the cerebellum. Like this could right? be at this moment could be a, a nice substrate for another book. I'll work on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Another novel. Yeah, yeah. But I, I I'm really excited about it. I mean, there's an element of. Um, I think reality to that. Yeah, yeah, no, that is super no, interesting. Complete, really complete. Uh, well, you know, it gets at, and again, this is you know just speculation, but um, if the cerebellum is really important for uh, uh, again the uh, let's say I just use optimization paradigm, yes, yes. motor speech, social, like you know, perhaps in things like uh, 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 and and people with autism are. are Poorly optimized, right. maybe like supercharging their cerebellum may yeah, actually. That's that's an interesting idea, you know, actually. Where basically you 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 do cerebellar stimulation yes. and you see if actually that enhances their ability to. Uh, well, that's because, that, because, that's really exciting because I just I just came back from a conference where someone not for autism, uh -huh. but for dystonia. You know, like there are these patients who have, uh, as you know, these problems where uh -huh. they're. Basically, they have a posture, they get oh, into sure. a posture, and they can because there's uh, incoordination of the, the yep. muscles. Like yeah. writer's cramp is one writer's of them. Writer's cramp is one of them. The violinist uh, thing. Like, uh, uh, right. And so this uh, scientist actually stimulated a region using deep brain stimulation uh, in the cerebellum. And it really, like, it was a, like a miracle in oh, these mice. Like, yeah. Uh, it, and it, I mean, it was based on uh, prior evidence that this part of the cerebellum is important. But imagine if we could do that for well, social because, interactions. Well, because again, an autistic child is socially rigid. Exactly. You know what I mean? They, they cannot adapt to changes. And so you basically just got to stimulate. So their system. moves in sort of socially would be very rigid and exactly. angular. And they've got, they've got cramped social interactions. Right. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, this is, a, this is one idea. The other thing that really fascinated me about the cerebellum was uh, through a slide that I saw here when I came to Washington University. So as you know, the former chair of our, the department that I'm leading right mm -hmm. now, led the Human Connectome Project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so he did, he took like 1,200 subjects and basically looked at all sorts of activities mm -hmm. in, the, in the brain, mm -hmm. uh, participants. Uh, and uh, one of the things that struck me was that every time that a, pa a person was subjected to a task, whether it was uh, memory uh, or social cognition task, mm -hmm. you know, understandably or, or not surprisingly, the, the cerebral cortex and the temporal lobe was mm -hmm. activated. Mm -hmm. But almost always, the cerebellum was also activated. So there's this thing called the cerebellar temporal, uh, sorry, the cerebrotemporal cerebellar loop mm -hmm. that takes mm -hmm. place. And so it actually does happen in the human brain as well. Mm. So there's real evidence for it. And when we studied this with resting state, uh, yeah. functional MRI, looking at brain networks, yes. there's, a, there's actually, it's the only area in the cerebellum, like basically if you look at cerebellar networks, mm -hmm. the only thing that shows an asymmetry in resting state networks is language. It, it's on the right side. Uh, that would make sense for yeah. the, in the right side of the cerebellum? Cerebellum, yeah. Because it's connecting to the left side of exactly. the, the exactly. cerebral cortex. Yeah, Interesting. Anyway, something for the future of yeah. science fiction, maybe. Let's yeah.